they went around in a perfect circle. Turns out he was wrong. Okay, which leads us to our next gentleman's. We meet Tycho Brahe. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but Tycho Brahe was a Dutch guy. Now he was actually the product of the Reformation. He was not during he was during the Renaissance time, sort of, but not really influenced by it. He was more in, uh, influenced by the Protestant, as in the religion, the Protestant religion, um, uh, Reformation. And he was uh, a nobleman in Danish Dutch dude. Um, but what he did is he was able to build some very accurate devices that measured the stars and the planets and such. And so how do they measure how far they are? They actually had like, you know, kind of fancy protractors that they used to point at the stars. Now still, no telescope, okay, but they could point and kind of measure all these things. And he was very good at making observations. So he was a great observer of the heavens, and he just wrote everything down. He was like Mr. Observer Guy. Okay, one thing really cool happened. In 1572, he observed, Bra observed a supernova. And this is actually a picture of the remnants of that same supernova that has been taken subsequently with a telescope. And what he noticed is that it did not move with respect to other stars. Okay, so he saw this supernova. So they, there was this belief of, from Ptolemy and the, the, these guys right here, Aristotle and Plato, that the universe was unchanging but all of a sudden they saw this supernova and they said, well, obviously something's changing. And um, so he made this decision, or the surmise, summary, the surmise means summary, that it was obviously outside the sphere of the other stars. Remember, they kind of had the sun at the center and out here, you know, you'd planet somewhere out here and then you had just the stars in some globe way, way out there. And, but he said that this supernova had to be somewhere on the outside because it didn't change with respect to the others. So that was his observation. And that led him to his heliocentric astronomy, geo-heliocentric model. He began, believed that the sun, well, it's kind of confusing. He said that we have the sun, everything revolves around the sun, but the earth is different and it revolves also. So it's, he had a kind of a weird model. No one's probably seen this one, um, but it was his uh, bra's model. Okay. He then had a student by the name of Johannes Kepler. Um, he was interested in astronomy at an early age. Interesting story is he saw a supernova, supernova and he, he also saw, no, no, it was a supernova. He saw a um, solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, one of the two, when he was a small child. And he thought that was the coolest thing he'd ever seen. And then he saw one other thing, which was a comet, and that kind of sealed the deal. Okay? But he decided as a young man to become a minister. But when he went to college... Um, they realized he had a major gift for mathematics. So he was just a great mathematician. And when he started looking for jobs, they said, well, uh, I think you'd be a good mathematician. So he became a professor of mathematics. Okay. And then he ran into some trouble. And um, long story, he, wouldn't, he married some gal and he wouldn't convert to Catholicism. Um, he was Protestant. And so um, he got in trouble. And so um, a guy by the name of Tycho Brahe, the guy we just talked about, well, he said, well, why don't you come work for me? And so he did, and he became uh, his student. Okay, and um, he gave a bra. Uh, he, or bra gave Tycho, or bra gave Kepler, if I can say this right, uh, a job. And he said, I want you to study my observations because you're a mathematician. Look at it mathematically. So he began to use his great mathematical brain to do this, and he discovered something interesting about Mars. He discovered that Mars' orbit was not, in fact, a circle. Okay. In fact, by this time, interesting thing is Kepler's eyes were starting to, to, to turn bad. And so he had bad eyes. And so he could look at you know, numbers on a piece of paper. He couldn't really study the stars because his eyes weren't very good. But he could do the math. And as he did the math, he says it's not a circle, but in fact it is an ellipse. Now what's an ellipse? Hmm. Okay. Well, here's how you make an ellipse. You can kind of see the ellipse. You'd take like two push pins and you'd take some string and you'd like make... Um, it looks like a circle, but it's actually kind of an oval. So an ellipse, that's how you'd make one. But what is an ellipse? Well, let's talk about the geometry of an ellipse. So now I know you're in a geometry, but this isn't that hard. So let's learn about how an ellipse works. First of all, in an ellipse, there are two spots, like the two points of the pen, and these are called the focus. Or the, There's two focuses. Uh, plural of focus is foci. Now, you should definitely be pausing the video, copying this down, etc., etc. So it's going to have two sort of centers, okay? 
And it's also got some other things that we want to learn about. And that is half of the distance between, you know, the, the, you know the, the, if you go from here all the way out to here, this is called the semi-major axis, which is the longest axis. They go from the center, if you will, of this. I'm not sure if I've drawn it right to the center. And that's called the semi-major axis. This, of course, is also from here to here, is also the semi-major axis, okay? And so this is uh, the properties of an ellipse, okay? It's an oval. Okay, some interesting things about the astronomy of ellipses, though. Uh, Mr. Kepler came up with three important laws. You should definitely copy these down. Kepler's got three laws, number one, number two, number three. Number one says planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. So if I go back to my ellipse picture, now you should pause if you, to write this down, but if I go back to my picture, hello, there it is, is the sun right here would be at one of the ellipses. And all the planets, if this, is, if this is a planet, would revolve around the sun, but in the shape of an ellipse as opposed to the shape of um, a circle. So let's talk about elliptical orbits here. So let's watch a quick animation about ellipses as they relate to like circles. So for example, a circle has one focus point. The distance is the same all the way around, the radius is. But if you have two foci, that results in an ellipse. And if you add up the length of both of those lines, they change. They are always the same. The sum is the same. So a circle is just a special case in an ellipse that has only one focus point. Now let's talk about that. Planets follow elliptical orbits around the sun, where the sun is at one of the foci, or the focus points. It moves fastest when it's closest to the sun and slowest when it's further away, as you can see on the animation. Okay. It goes faster when it's closer and slower when it's further away. Zoom fast there because he got closer. Now he's going to slow down. Okay? Okay. So that was his first law. The second law, this is an interesting one, the orbital speed of a planet varies so that the line joining the sun and the planet will sweep equal areas in equal time intervals. What in the world does that mean? Well, here's a picture to show it to you. So if I've got a planet, here's the sun at one focus, okay, is if the planet is moving in this direction, in a given time, let's say that this takes, um, you know, 30 days, or let's say uh, two months, uh, 60 days. I don't know. Let's say that's two months for it to go travel from there to there. Um, and then if we go from here to here, all right, from there to there, you know what? That's going to take um, 60 days. Because what's true about these two purple um, um, areas, if you will, is that if you do the area, you know, the area like, uh, like you know, the square miles, these two area are the same. So they will have equal areas. So if I were to shade this in and take like a ruler and somehow measure it, it can be done with some pretty high level math, that the area of A is equal to the area of C, which also would equal the area of B. Now for that to be true, if this planet travels from here to here in 60 days, and in for example A, he travels from here to here, he's traveling much, much faster here than here. And this is slower. So even though you have the same time interval, the planets sometimes move faster around the sun than they do. So the closer you are to the sun, the faster you move. The further from the sun, the slower it moves. And that is one of the functions. And it turns out that's, that's, that's exactly true. All right. And then we have his third law. And he said the amount of time a planet takes to orbit the sun is related to its orbit size, such that the period P that's the period, how long it takes to go up, period, P, all right, stands, uh, well, I'll write it down, is squared, is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. What in the world does that mean? Now, what's P? P is the period. Now, what does that mean? That is how long, for example, the period of our Earth is one year, or 365 days. Okay, and so the period of Mars is a different number. So if you know what that is, you can actually find what the semi-major axis is. You can do some math. In fact,